Thanks very much, and thank you guys for really sticking close to time so we have plenty of um, opportunity to, to, to dive deep um, into those subjects. Um, to start us off, um, I think it, it's a, a little bit uh, kind of touching upon some of the job descriptions um, that, that Sarah mentioned initially, uh, and this is probably, you know, to, to all of you. Um, how does a li do, how do library publishers align with other more traditional library functions uh, in your varying uh, experiences? Gotcha. You want me to go? um, so I'll, I'll just give a couple examples uh, from my recent experience at Mason. I uh, have hired recently a digital publishing manager and actually before I joined Mason, they had advertised that position. Uh, it was a only placed in library um, job boards and had said, you know, has to have an ML MLIS degree. And they didn't really get much of a response. I came in and you know, was doing the publishing and I was re-advertising that I originally uh, suggested that we just require a master's and not kind of say MLIS, just master's degree, um, and was um, asked to say MLIS preferred, you know, master's degree required. I got it on a lot of publishing job boards. We had quite a few good finalists, um, and some of them were librarians and some weren't, and I ended up hiring somebody that was not a librarian, but could have easily hired a librarian. So that was a job that could have been either way. I know with my own job was kind of the same thing. They were looking at librarians. I came from the publishing side. So I think a lot of, um, a lot of the library publishing jobs could probably go either way. That's, that's my experience. Okay. I think, as I mentioned, a lot of the library publishing services that we're seeing emerging are outgrowths of an institutional repository program that already exists and is leveraging a lot of the skills that the institutional repository managers and other people associated with that program already bring to a potential publishing role. And those those include, um, you know, experience with with curation of content, um, both in terms of the um, you know, the kind of technical metadata and taxonomies and, and organization and discovery kind of um, strengths that um, library people with a library technical services background would bring to that kind of endeavor, uh, all the way to the uh, copyright and intellectual property knowledge that a scholarly communications librarian brings to that type of, um, of work. Uh, and the, um, the, integration with campus and the position that the library already holds as a campus entity with connections to various um, with to with connections to the student and faculty population on campus and the various centers that are already publishing a lot of content and faculty that are already publishing a lot of content either on their own or with other um, scholarly publishers. Um, so I think the relationships that libraries bring is a, a huge um, advantage for them as they're starting library publishing programs. I think this is an interesting question. Uh, if one focuses on traditional library services, I think the answer is that library publishing services don't align very well at all. Uh, and many, many libraries are missing opportunities uh, because they're not able to um, think across traditional boundaries. And I would say that includes Michigan. Um, so, for example, um, you know, with a technical services group in the library, you have a huge wealth of expertise in metadata, um, cataloging, discoverability, thinking about um, maximizing access. And yet, um, I think we've seen some figures at this uh, meeting that um, you know, open access content is still not really being made discoverable. Um, and so that's open access content includes what library publishers are producing. So how, why we're not leveraging the technical services expertise we have in our own libraries to really solve some of those open access discoverability problems illustrates a lack of joined up thinking. Um, collection development is another area. Um, uh, you know, uh, so thinking about um, uh, challenges around, uh, uh, you know, 
pr 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 preserving preserving our, our digital collections. Um, again, uh, you know, library publishers tend to have solutions that everybody has. I, I mean, clocks, uh, portico. I mean, maybe our, they're not thinking creatively about access to Hattie Trust and other uh, um, you know major library collected uh, created um, uh, preservation. Um, sources, and that again illustrates non-joined up thinking. Um, information literacy, reference and instruction, um, this is an area where there seems to be opportunity as John mentioned, um, so the publishing as pedagogy, uh, involving students in uh, the publishing process as part of their, um, as a way of helping them to really sort of um, get used to the idea of publishing as a way of uh, really clarifying their ideas, especially when more students are doing undergraduate research. Great opportunities there, not generally being taken advantage of. The one area, so I just wanted to come back to data services. So this is a new, f new area of activity for libraries, and this is a place where there's major opportunity um, for synergy. I do think, you know, libraries tend to think of data in terms of collections still, and that is, um, you know, collections driven by mandates. So authors are forced to deposit data, and then the library preserves it. But I think the opportunity with library publishing is to say, what could we do to actually incentivize authors to deposit their data in a way where they're actually expecting and wanting reuse? And that is a very important um, change that we have to make in the way that we think about data as, uh, 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 as libraries, because otherwise we're going to have this massive data that authors have made as unreproducible as possible, um, which is going to be the result of the mandate. So how can we think about data services more as publishers uh, than as uh, collection development people? Okay. Do we have questions from the group? And just because we're, ca we're capturing the audio from the microphones up here and we don't, unfortunately, have a microphone for you, I'd ask whoever's going to first respond to repeat the question. So, yes. Go ahead. Let me see. Let me see if I could repeat your question. Okay. So, uh, if I understood you correctly, you were saying uh, if the open access would sort of downgrade uh, the the value of the publication. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll try to repeat it better then. So the, 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 the university press is, is publishing sort of more um, high quality and non-open access and a, and a secondary division publishing open access that might uh, create or reinforce a perception that open access is lower quality work. Um, so, yeah, I didn't really go into much detail about this in my slides, partly because you know we, we're trying to cut down time. But um, in my model for the university press, we are pursuing open access. Um, I am not planning to do it sort of as a possibility, but more as a default. I'm, I'm going to try to um, try to do everything open access if, if possible. Um, it might depend project by project. One thing, I came to your presentation, which was very good, by the way. Um, one difference from your model and the one of University of California Press is I don't plan to sort of make it one or the other. Like, it's either open access and it's open everywhere, or it's commercial and it's only sold. So I'm, I'm going to try to meld the two in the sense of make an open access version of the university press book, but also sell it wherever possible and as much as possible. 
So, uh, so I would hope that it wouldn't reinforce that position. And the kind of secondary, uh, you know, I wouldn't even call it secondary, but it's just a different model of like open access journals. It's really stuff that really doesn't have commercial potential in the first place. So, um, and the, you know, they're either faculty led or student run, but they're, you know, they're not, it's not like they could be charging subscriptions, but they're not. It's more like this is, open and it's always going to be open so yes I, I think it's a good point I mean um, so <clears throat> the University Press uh, Michigan does actually do some open access uh, publishing for as a university press we have a we do have an open access list um, and we do participate in things like knowledge unlatched and so on so we do try uh, and work out uh, business models of achieving open access um, the challenge is a really a pragmatic one, which is, um, uh, you know, the university press is still needs to cover its costs. Um, and uh, actually, I'm sure we'll get on to sustainability questions, but uh, uh, the university press really should be doing more than covering its costs and should be pr uh, producing surplus, which should be coming back into um, supporting some of this other activity that we're doing. Um, and in this period where we don't yet see a very clear way forward for open access monographs, um, I think we're just being very cautious in that area. Um, but uh, yeah, the risk, is, the risk is clearly there. Um, it's interesting to see, you know, about 25% of university presses are now reporting to libraries. And one of the big qu questions for the libraries they're reporting to is, you know, how hard to push those, you know, um, uh, you know, ways of doing things that are very consistent with the values of the libraries. So I think it's true that most library deans and directors are being fairly um, understanding and hands-off in terms of uh, allowing the university press to chart its own course to decide what to do. Um, the pressure tends to be, and the interest in uh, making things different, tends to be actually on the uh, uh, contracts on author contracts. So certainly in our contracts, we've, um, we tend to allow embargo periods now, uh, open access after a certain period. Um, we've certainly gone over to authors retaining copyright. Um, so things like that. Um, but you're right, there's a danger there. It's pragmatic at the moment. Question. Other questions? Yes, sure. We faced a lot of challenges and uh, concern from faculty um, uh, late last year, um, where there was concern that the library was destroying the university press brand, uh, that uh, um, this, uh, you know, the Michigan publishing thing was messing with uh, the quality association of the university press. Um, and so one of the first things that uh, I did when I arrived was really ring fence these different entities. So um, we issue uh, books under different ISBN prefixes. Uh, we actually use completely different uh, uh, vendors for our printing. Um, uh, we have different workflows. Um, we uh, have different faculty governance structures. So the University Press still has an editorial board. Um, the uh, uh, Michigan Publishing Services reports up through a thing called the Library Council. Um, so in every possible way, we're ring-fencing the university press brand. Um, and um, for example, to the extent that when I write to somebody as Michigan Publishing Services, I will use my associate university librarian signature. Um, I, when I write to somebody as the university press, we'll use the university press signature line, um, different business cards. I mean, it's, it's really important. Um, we don't want uh, to undermine the university press brand um, what's happening, of course, which is great, is that behind the scenes, uh, we're merging um, support services, so production, technology, uh, things like that. Um, uh, and, um, you know, so it's, it's a real concern, and we have to be very careful about it. 
There was another question over here. Yes. I, I don't have a clear answer to that question. I can uh, confirm that, that it is the case that most libraries are um, relying on their operating budget to run their library publishing programs, and the majority get most or all of their funding from their operating budget, and only a small minority are using any part of their collections budget as uh, redirecting that spending into um, the, the production of, um, of e-journals or books or other kinds of library publications. Um, and I, I don't have, um, uh, you know, I think it's, um, I think Charles and John can probably speak better to the kind of internal discussions and politics that, that go into library budgeting and the kind of territorial um, uh, considerations that libraries have over, over how that money is spent. But I absolutely agree that redirecting money from purchasing to publishing seems to make a tremendous amount of sense. Um, I think it makes the most sense if we can reliably um, aggregate and access those collections on the other hand. I think that's, that remains a significant barrier uh, as, uh, as has been mentioned several times, getting, these, getting open access publications into library catalogs, ensuring that they're out there, they're discoverable, that we have good, way, good mechanisms of, of making them available to libraries is going to be a concern because those are, um, that's going to play, going to factor into the decision making if, um, if these publications that are being produced by the library don't actually become a permanent and discoverable part of the collection, then it's going to be a much harder case to make that the collection's budget should be subsidizing that work. Um, well, I'll, I'll speak very briefly on this, but I, I'm new to the library world in the sense of working in a library. I've worked with a lot of libraries before. Um, I think that it's difficult to try to get money from collections because they're already being squeezed a lot, at least in my experience. They're being squeezed in a lot of different areas, um, so it's kind of difficult to get money out of them. I do think, and we'll probably talk about this more, but I do think the sustainability of library publishing and sustainability of academic publishing in general is probably the greatest challenge. So the as I mentioned in one of my slides, it's just trying to get funds from as many different sources as possible, but I don't see it as coming from collections. I, I can say in my case, uh, the library's given me some staff out of the operating budget, uh, but other than that, no, no budget at all. So I have you know some staff, which I'm very grateful for, but other than that, I don't have any funds to to actually do anything. So I have to find the money to do things. Yeah, I mean, um, this will be a real mark of library publishing coming of age uh, when um, uh, you know, substantial funding is diverted from collections. Um, uh, it's not happening yet. Um, uh, and these, um, these operations are running on a shoestring. I mean, the 1.8 FTE, this is uh, clearly a rounding error for many libraries. Um, and um, it's a scalability issue uh, is therefore really in play. And to scale, scale, scale these programs, uh, some really tough decisions probably will have to be made about uh, using the acquisitions budget. Um, that is going to be extremely tricky. Uh, um, you know, firstly, the acquisitions budget is uh, generally coming uh, from the provost, um, and uh, the library is a steward of it. So this really means changing the provost's uh, view of the worth of library publishing. Um, uh, there also will be some cancellation decisions that will have to be made uh, at this stage to divert funding uh, to, um, to the library publishing unit. Um, it's going to be exciting when it starts to happen, um, 
but it's not really happening a lot yet, as far as I can see. Um, Michigan is actually supported. Our library publishing operation, some of the staffing is actually supported from the collections budget, but it's, uh, it, it's sort of, there's an odd history behind that, and it was kind of a, a one-off settlement a while ago, um, uh, and it's, it's, not, it's not sort of done on an ongoing basis. But I totally agree, that will be, that will be the mark of the library publishing movement coming of age when that starts to happen. So I have a, a question uh, kind of feeding off some of these issues since the staff of, of staff at these programs are relatively small and we, I know we have some vendors in the audience, does library publishing offer opportunities there to do some of the things that the small staff just doesn't have the capacity to do or maybe that they're already doing for other types of publishers? What, what's your thoughts on working with vendors for some of these things? We're seeing, I would say that most, that all library publishing programs are currently working with some, at least one vendor, um, whether it's a platform provider um, or uh, a um, companies that, that do XML conversion or um, uh, print on demand services. There's a variety of services that libraries are already investing in, um, especially because they don't have the staff on hand and they don't have the scale in most cases to justify a, a, you know, a full-time internal position. Um, I think the biggest challenge is exactly that, the scale. Um, libraries are finding it's difficult to find vendors uh, who will work with such small publishing programs uh, and, and can justify their time in building a client relationship uh, with these small publishing programs. Um, and so I think that's something that is a, a challenge for libraries and vendors potentially to look at together in terms of how um, libraries could, could coordinate on their end to, to um, you know, build a portfolio that would be uh, something that a vendor would want to take on or how vendors might work to, to be able to provide services at a smaller scale than they typically do that would satisfy some of these needs. Um, they're certainly out there. Many library publishing programs have aspirations of, of producing um, high quality, very you know, professional looking publications. They want the um, they want publications that are durable, that work across platforms, that um, are uh, being channeled into the correct discovery systems, um, and um, but are and and don't have the internal staff or uh, skill sets in many cases to make that happen. Um, so I certainly see opportunities, uh, but also some some pretty concrete challenges for um, library and vendor relationships. Yes, I, I mean, I, I would agree with that, although, um, I mean, it, you know, I wouldn't underestimate the business either. Uh, so at my last, uh, in my last position at Purdue University, I mean, you know, we had a rich relationship with Charlesworth, uh, and uh, there it was, you know, it was maybe 50 technical, technical reports a year um, going out and being handled by Charlesworth, but still, that's 50 technical reports of, uh, you know, 200, 300 pages each. Um, so... Um, I do think uh, uh, also another thing, and this is probably not the right thing to say, but um, libraries can be a little bit less price sensitive um, in the vendor space. Um, so, uh, you know, the battle to the bottom, uh, working with big com You know, libraries uh, um, are, are used to uh, paying for good service, uh, recognize that uh, they don't have the scale, um, and are very good payers, and always pay on time, eventually. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. I was wondering if perhaps Charles could also view Johnson's consultation as somewhat similar structure with a repository. If you could expand a little bit on the remark you made about trying to incentivize greater use of the original material in the repository, how do you see that, the two of you, sitting in these sort of hybrid spaces? Uh, so, I mean, I've been thinking quite a lot about uh, what is the unique value that a publishing perspective can bring to repositories, um, especially with the development of this new data repository. Um, 
And I think there's a certain amount of expertise that we can bring in terms of uh, product development and um, sort of the packaging and the way that we sell the product to authors. Um, I also think we have uh, a, a strong tradition of being interested in um, uh, uh, metrics, uh, in, in, in uh, delivering uh, analytics to authors that incentivize them, and a lot of those um, are driven of, uh, from making objects citable, for example. So, you know, use of DOIs and um, uh, the outmetric buttons and the killer app, which I always loved, was uh, with uh, Digital Commons from Berkeley Electronic Press, the monthly um, download counts, these rich statistics provided to authors in their email boxes every month. Um, that's a very publishing type thing to do. And then the third thing is, um, making sure that the uh, materials and information in, in institutional repositories are linked into the information supply chain because we understand the information supply chain as producers of content. And so uh, we understand what it takes to feed to indexes. Um, we understand the, uh, you know, we are registered to issue DOIs, you know, we're Crossref members. Um, uh, we uh, understand that Amazon is the largest book discovery engine, right? And we want to work out ways of getting um, these open access materials into Amazon. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of value add. Um, and, uh, you know, we, it really is so important that we figure this out with data uh, because, um, you know, my wife's a physical chemist. I mean, she laughs at the idea that she would put her best reproducible data into an institutional repository. Um, that's already sabotaged as soon as it goes in, if she's forced to do it. Now, if um, she knows that that material is going to be uh, reused and she's going to be credited for that reuse, and she's going to get metrics that come back that she can put into her tenure dossier, her attitude completely changes, and she will make sure that data is reproducible, reusable, valuable. But she's not going to do that if she's forced to do it. Um, in, in my case, it's uh, at this point more an education thing than anything because they've had the repository for a while um, and it's been used for EDTs, but it's not particularly user friendly. So trying to make it easier to accept materials, you know, that people don't have to go through a really cumbersome project process and, and to, to make more people aware that it exists. So, so that's really where I'm kind of ramping it up. And I, I agree with what Charles says, the more you could provide metrics on usage, on downloads, on access, the more people will be interested. But right now for me, it's just you know, getting the word out that it exists. And you know, just to give one quick example, the open access journals that we've been doing, um, we're not being put into the repository, and so that was like one easy step of like making sure that those journal articles get into the repository as well. So, um, and I, I would add, I mean, institutional repositories are at a difficult time at the moment. Um, if you're an institutional repository manager, you're seeing threats on every horizon. Um, uh, Academia.edu, ResearchGate, etc. On the one hand. Um, the uh, OSTP mandates coming out with incredibly centralized solutions. On the other hand, um, chorus, uh, you know, uh, over there. On the other hand, I mean, it's a horrible time to be an institutional repository manager. So, um, you know, taking a new perspective on institutional repositories, thinking of them as publishing platforms, uh, that introduces new joy into our lives. <laughs> I want to make sure that we can dive a little bit deeper into sustainability. Um, it sounds like uh, a lot of the new things that presses become involved with when they start uh, within the structure of the library are not necessarily revenue generating or at least not high revenue uh, generating items. What's your sort of take on whether this is a sustainable activity for, for the press to take on in a time when we're already seeing you know, struggles in that space. So, I mean, I, I think that's probably the central question um, that I grapple with, but the, the only good side of that coin, too, is, is that there 
relatively low cost. Um, you know, the things that I'm doing, the, the, we're not talking about millions of dollars. You know, we're talking about thousands or hundreds of thousands, but we're not talking about millions. So in the big scheme of things, it's not a huge chunk. That being said, I think almost every university that I know of is is facing you know fiscal issues, um, so it's it's not to be underestimated. So I th that's one reason why I think that you have to try to get revenue or get funding from as many different sources as possible, um, and try to uh, keep operations very lean and try to keep workflows very efficient. Um, and I. Hopefully, it'll work out. Um, well, so, uh, I mean, there are a couple of layers to that question. I mean, if one's thinking as a university press and thinking of one of these sort of merged entities, I mean, publishing services is a great area to go into um, because uh, uh, there's quite a lot of money sloshing around on campus which is being badly used um, for uh, sort of publishing purposes. Uh, and that's always been the case. I mean, the classic example uh, on the UC campuses, uh, you know, the study back in 2006, 300 independent publishing units over the U UC campuses. Uh, and I think that's replicated at smaller scale um, on almost all our campuses. We probably have, oh, I don't know, s sort of 70 journals um, uh, happening all over the, all over the campus. Um, so, there's a, quite a lot of money being spent on publishing that's being badly used, and um, it could be much better used if uh, uh, it was entrusted to the kind of library publishing service, the publishing service. And it's interesting, recently, I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, this post, but uh, University of North Carolina Press, which is, um, it doesn't have a library publishing service, but it's, uh, it's just announced that it's opening a publishing service operation for the 17 campuses that it serves. University of Hawaii Press, again, increasing its publishing services operations. So, oh really, okay, interesting. So, I mean, <coughs> publishing services is a good area to, uh, for diversifying press revenue. Um, if one thinks in terms of a library publisher, I mean, I totally agree with John. I mean, the aim is to keep your workflows as inexpensive as possible because that's very mission-related in how you keep these publications that deserve to exist but are having financial trouble um, sustainable. Um, but uh, again, you know, as an independently operating library publishing service, and remember that uh, you know, 2,500 four-year colleges, uh, or isn't even more, um, only 100 university presses. So a lot of library publishing services, a lot of these 125 or whatever uh, um, op uh, library publishing operations are existing at institutions without a university press. And there they have the opportunity, if they can get through the institutional barriers to creating recharge rates, which is quite something, um, they have the opportunity to charge back for their services and to take advantage of some of that uh, campus money which is being badly spent at the moment. So I think there are some good options, even if we don't go the acquisitions uh, um, uh, fund, uh, you know, the collections, the collections fund route. I think there are some good options for scaling on a small level. Yeah, I, I mean, I would mainly echo Charles and, and John, but uh, re-emphasize the, the, that libraries are uh, really relying on, um, the, on streamlining workflows and efficiency, keeping costs low, and on the, the assumption that storage costs are going to continue to decrease, there will be increasing um, opportunities for automation of, of a lot of um, the production work that, that goes into publication and um, that there is a, um, you know, a competitive vendor space as well that they can, can rely on to do some of the services that they can't do in-house. Um, and then, I, and again, I think, so there are some opportunities for reducing costs. Um, the, and then going back to that question of the collections budget, we know that there is enough money in the system right now to sustain all of this publishing that's going on, um, and it's, it's not being used as efficiently as it could be. And so, the, you know, we know that, that um, the money exists within the system, and it's just being directed in different ways. Um, and so I think the, um, the question of sustainability is, is all about um, redirecting money that's currently 
in the system, both on campus and in the scholarly publishing system, uh, into these activities, which you know can ultimately um, make the scholarly publishing process more efficient and give uh, universities and libraries more of a return on their investment in the, the scholarly content. I just, uh, just wanted to add one thing that hasn't really been said here, but I think is uh, often an impetus uh, behind the library publishing efforts is uh, in part in part a, a way to justify libraries' continued existence. Uh, I have heard comments at, at my campus and at other campuses like why, you know, like why? Uh, and it seems kind of strange that faculty would say that, but it's not that uncommon. And so, you know, libraries are not going away as places to preserve, you know, provide access to journals, but they are looking at other ways to show value in their campus communities, and this is one way to do that. So again, if, if you could keep the costs low and keep workflows efficient and not be a, a strain, you know, that, that's, I think, one of the ways to be sustainable, too. Seems like maybe a little bit of an odd strategy given that we hear frequently, why do we need publishers? <laughs> so <laughs> bringing the publishers in, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if that would be necessarily the path that I would take. Coming from a, a, a publisher point of view first and now being within the library, was it as you expected? What surprised you? You know, the, the hidden life of, of, of librarians. Um, I think a lot of times publishers believe they know what a day in the life of a librarian is like. Um, how did you, or are they um, not allowed to tell now? No. <laughs> That's why it's secret. Well, uh, I mean, a couple of things um, really have impressed me um, about working, working with library colleagues. Um, uh, I mean, one of the things is uh, how very, very seriously uh, libraries take uh, their responsibility for stewarding resources uh, well, um, uh, you know, we see that as publishers, of course, and it's like, ugh, you know, uh, this is this is hard work dealing with libraries. But what uh, the librarians we're dealing with are doing are being extremely responsible stewards of resources and trying to get the most for their local patrons. Um, it's a funny situation because uh, with acquisitions and collections development hats on the same people who one knows as generous donors to scholarly communication sort of um, uh, advocacy and things like that, those same people will become extremely hard-headed. So it's a Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde kind of, uh, Mr. Hyde's kind of situation. It's very interesting to see that happening. Uh, and that comes down again to the acquisitions budget versus the operating budget and how librarians approach those two budgets very differently. The one other thing I would say is, one of the things that I love about being part of a library is um, the libraries I've worked in have a very strong um, dedication to organizational culture, to positive organizational culture. They care deeply about diversity. Uh, they care about respectful environments. Um, they, they, they care about, um, uh, you know, uh, have at their base uh, deep ethical beliefs um, in uh, things around privacy and uh, uh, patron privacy and uh, um, uh, understanding difference and things like that. And, you know, um, small publishers, especially uh, a lot of university presses, don't have great cultures uh, and have uh, sometimes had rather sick cultures, in fact, because they're often not big enough to invest uh, in that kind of concentrated effort around building positive organizational cultures. So. Um, I love being within a library context because um, I feel that's really important and it, 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 uh, it, it gives us a more creative workspace, it gives us some more, more options for being experimental um, and, uh, you know, f feeling more valued. Um, I would definitely agree with, with what Charles is saying. Um, it's a very supportive environment. Um, I, at, in my own case, you know, it's, it's all new, but people have been very curious, uh, really wanting to learn as much about publishing and about what we plan to do, and also, you know, being uh, sharing with their own knowledge. Um, in my own case, I 
had never worked in a library before, but had worked with a lot of librarians um, at, at Rand Corporation where I was, had a very collaborative relationship with the library there. And um, so it, it wasn't a strange environment to be in. I, I would say one of the things I really like about working in, inside a library is there's lots of books there. You, know? <laughs> you, you just wander through around and like grab books and you know, nobody asks you what you're doing. So that's, that's <laughs> kind of cool. Do we have other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the way we think about it at Michigan is that we need to be business-like in all of our operations. And um, that means um, thinking, of, uh, thinking about financial sustainability, um, but uh, recognizing that uh, you know, we're able to draw on a, a number of hybrid sources. One of, the, uh, one of the things that we've done with the University Press is we've moved the University of Michigan Press from a, 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 a status called auxiliary into a status called designated. And what that uh, is about is that uh, we now expect uh, the university to judge the university press um, not just, not, not, not primarily in terms of its revenue generation capacity, but in terms of its um, success at achieving mission. Um, but the important thing about the designated status is it still has the requirement that that operation acts in a business-like way and breaks even. Um, and breaks even plus generates a little bit of surplus to reinvest, so is not a burden to the university. So I think it's very much about um, how one uh, thinks of that revenue generation um, requirement um, in terms of whether it dictates everything you do or whether it's just in, always in the back of your mind. Um, uh, but I recognize what you say, um, and it's, 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 a, it's a good point. Well, it, it, it reminds me of the saying that um, I've heard, uh, I'm not sure who originally said this, but I've heard it quite a bit in the university press community, is that, well, nobody expects the chemistry department to break even, so you know, why do they expect the university press department to break even, which is a good question to ask. Um, but I, I just go back to the point of, you know, if you're causing a strain in a fiscal environment that's constantly under pressure, you know, it's, it's the first thing to get cut. Whereas if you're breaking even or creating a surplus, there's not that reason to, you know, cut you out of the budget. So that's, that's I think, just good business sense, really. I th it, it occurs to me that, you know, we talk a lot about uh, proxies in, in this line of work and how do we evaluate the quality of scholarship or the quality of a faculty member's contributions or this and that. And I think we, we still think of the revenue generation and sales of a university press is a proxy for it performing a service. They manage to sell that many books and they manage to sustain themselves and therefore they're a successful operation. And we have different proxies for the quality of the contribution of a library or, or a chemistry department or, or what have you. And so I think 
challenging maybe the, the assumptions that that's a good metric for, uh, for evaluating the success of a press might be a step in, in, that, in challenging that kind of mantra because we don't have, um, you know, it would be coming up with different ways of evaluating what the press's contribution was and um, convincing the, um, the campus administration that those were, were measures that um, the press's work should be evaluated on and should justify continued investment in their work. More questions? Sure. Um, I mean, in the context of this particular meeting of, of SSP, I, I think one thing that's, that's interesting about library publishing is um, I know, you know, looking um, from, a, from a commercial publishing perspective or an association publishing perspective or a learned society publishing perspective where one is having to, um, you know, cover all one's costs, I mean, really think uh, about competing in the marketplace, it's irritating to look at a university press, which is substantially propped up by university subsidies, and it's even probably more irritating to look at a library publisher. Um, but one of the things that I think is important to recognize is that um, the people who are working in library publishing are, even if they're coming from very traditional library backgrounds, are really starting to understand what publishing is about and what value it adds and what a painful process it is to work with authors and you know all these all these various things that we that you know publishers know and it means that what's happening in libraries is a group of people are developing who share a lot of common interests um, common understanding uh, and sympathy uh, and uh, for other publishers and also value uh, value what publishers do and that means that growing up in libraries uh, if you are a commercial publisher or an association publisher or a learned press, a learned society, or a university press, um, you know, you're suddenly finding a group there who are your advocates and want to work with you on things like discovery of open access content, on joint standards, on finding sustainable ways of doing new sorts of publishing. Even, and John mentioned this, on um, referring faculty to you. I mean, if you are a publisher who libraries know are do, is doing the right thing, struck this morning by Rosa's point about um, the, uh, the, print, the print version, print materials being kind of cost recovery but not a lot more, that consciousness about double dipping and avoiding it, that's the sort of thing that if we know about it, uh, you will have liaison librarians going, well, you might consider Palgrave. You know, so you have, you have a lot of allies within the library if you are one of those publishers. And I think that's an important thing to recognize. Well, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you guys for, for coming. And if we can have uh, one more hand for the, for the panel, that would be fantastic.